Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Are you ready? Are you in a food coma? Did you get coffee or tea? <laughs> okay, so we are here today to talk about open source experience, which you already have since you're here. And those who are watching offline, hopefully you have some too or will feel inspired to have some. Before we dive in, who we are. Uh, my name is Iliko Vancha. I'm director of community at the Open Infra Foundation. I've been with the foundation for almost eight years now. This is my record uh, being with the same organization. So uh, you can tell how much I, I really do like my job. Um, I'm active uh, or been active in open source for over 11 years. Um, contributed to several open source projects and I became a big advocate and enthusiast and we will dive into why in a bit. And I don't know which one of us is doing this, but the audio guys will figure this out. Hopefully, yes. And hello, I'm Phil Robb. Uh, I've been doing open source of just under 25 years. Um, and uh, started my open source career at Hewlett Packard, uh, formed an open and ran their open source program office uh, uh, from 06 to 13. 13 to 19, worked at the Linux Foundation, uh, helped to, to manage the Linux Foundation networking projects, and then joined Ericsson in 2019, shortly after Build to Go left Ericsson. Um, for Ericsson, I, I run a series of companies that are focused on upstream open source development. So I've spent the better part of my career, uh, particularly managerial career, uh, when I wasn't just a developer, um, basically translating the needs of an open source ecosystem to large organizations and translating the needs and desires of large organizations to open source ecosystems. So trying to build that bridge to the benefit of both. And now that you roughly know who we are, we also want to know who are you? So, a few questions. And first, we will try to figure out if you are an open source user. Are you using open source software? So, uh, who's in here using open source? You personally, your organization? Hopefully, everybody in the room. <laughs> yes. I think there were one or two people who did not show hands. Also, uh, do you think you're aware of every single open source bit and piece in the stack that you're using, or there might be some hidden open source pieces? And I'm asking this because apparently 80% of global software infrastructure is open source. So if your hand was not up, or again, if you're watching offline and you did not plan to raise your hand, I think that this is the time to rethink whether or not you're actually using open source software. Well, better yet, let's ask the question of the folks in the room. Is 80% about right? Would you say that you know, the software you're using and, and your companies are using about 80% is right? Show of hands, yes, or is that off? About right? Yeah. Maybe more? We've seen studies that continually repeat that number, and I would say it's true for our organization. So um, now that we established that open source is a big piece in our lives, what you all think your role is in open source? Who here is an open source contributor? Good chunk. Maintainer? Still a good Next chunk. One. Nice. Is there anyone here who's managing teams who are contributing to open source? A really good Fair job. number there, too. All right. Amazing to see. Well, then and we've all figured this out. Okay, this can be a very short session. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the question still arises, what else is there? And we will get back to that one a little bit later. But, I mean, what is open source in the first place? Is there really an agreement about what open source is? To uh, give you two perspectives on, on open source, Open source definition from OSI, Open Source Initiative. Anyone in the room who's never seen this? Nope. Amazing. So um, this one is more around licensing, distribution, accessibility of, of the open source code. Um, another one, this one is from Wikipedia, because we, at least I, still go to Wikipedia sometimes when I'm trying to figure things out. 
Now, this is a very different take on open source. Uh, I highlighted a few um, phrases in there, and you can see that the Wikipedia definition mentions open collaborations, contributors, indefinite number of contributors. So uh, this definition is focusing also on how the software and artifacts, uh, artifacts are getting created and is looking into that human aspect of open source beyond the fact that it is in fact a license type. And I guess part of the reason we want to kind of <coughs> call that out is a lot of people will just say, well, it's open source. And when we're talking about licenses, that's relatively well defined by the OSI. But collaborative development, the way collaborative development is done, the way a community operates, who's part of that community, what their agendas are, who's got the control structures within that, they're snowflakes, right? There's, it's different for absolutely every project. And the experience, hence back to the title, of, of what, you're, what you're doing and the experience you have in that community is really dependent upon the type of community that you're part of, as well as the organization from which you come. Uh, so that's kind of what we wanted to explore here. So as Phil mentioned, we are diving deeper into the open source ecosystem and these experiences because there are a lot of different kinds of them. Depending on who you talk to, uh, like how much they figured open source out, that is varying to a large extent. So uh, we chose to uh, learn about people's experiences through running a podcast. Um, and our motivating factors in creating that podcast was what, quoting Phil, um, is that the fact that open source is, in a lot of time, counterintuitive. And it's not that easy to figure that out. There's also a lot of um, conversations and rocks thrown into that little pond of the open source ecosystem that are making big waves these days. So uh, the longevity of, of open source, the ecosystem is really not guaranteed and we all play a role in, uh, in the sustainability of it. So uh, we would like to understand both the side of what's happening in communities and what people's experiences are in open source communities. Can they participate? How they can participate? Um, is it working? Is it a welcoming, inclusive environment? And the corporate enterprise side, like companies who are getting involved in open source, who are open sourcing their projects, um, have they figured open source out? How to integrate open source into all their workflows? Um, so uh, we would like to provide resources through sharing people's experiences because sometimes it's much easier to understand and relate to something when you hear someone else, how someone else uh, went through it. Yeah. And take a photo. I'm not going to take uh, time on the, on the slide. Here's where you can find a podcast if you're interested in uh, listening to full episodes or snippets. And now we will go into some details in terms of uh, our conversations with people so far. And the first step is one thing that we always ask people every single time, what open source is for them, what it means, what they associate to um, when we ask that question. Like, Rapid fire exercise, what is open source? And um, I made a very basic word cloud something here that, that shows really nicely um, and resembling back to the two definitions that I showed you earlier, or we showed you earlier, the license type and even bigger, community. A lot of people are saying community first. Um, so yeah, kind of the, the two sides of the same coin, I would say. Yep. If that's a good an analogy to use. And now, challenges and solutions, or at least uh, pointing towards solutions, because there's still a long way to go um, in terms of the open source ecosystem. We will start with a community view. Um, and I, uh, or we brought a few examples uh, that we mentioned throughout the podcast to kind of deep, uh, dive a little bit deeper here. So the first one is trend of single vendor projects. 
Anyone experienced that, having more of these popping up? Yeah. More and, or less? Yeah. And also out of curiosity, who here actually has some level of responsibility for trying to foster a community? <laughs> either as a community leader or as a participant that's really trying to gain. Okay, so a lot of folks there as well. All right, very good. Um, and yeah, as we know who have been in the open source ecosystem for a while, single vendor projects have been around for a while. Um, I would argue that Open Infrastructure Foundation started off mostly with Rackspace, right? And I always found Rackspace to be a and poster NASA. child. Uh, what's that? And NASA. And NASA, we, but there were so many more folks from Rackspace than there were from NASA. Um, and Rackspace, well, they were interesting because, you know, that ecosystem, when it started, it was, good heavens, it had such a flurry of activity around it, right? Um, every company wanted to be involved. They really needed it to create a, into, a, into a foundation because there wasn't any trust built with Rackspace. Would they just take all of these contributors' code and take it away? And Rackspace made a point at those early OpenStack open events, um, and I loved it because every time the leader of Rackspace would stand up on stage and say, Rackspace is 83% of the contributions in the last quarter, and then they'd go up to the next meeting and say, Rackspace was 79%, then Rackspace was 71%, then Rackspace was 65%, and we're so proud that we're less of the contributing force of this project because it means we're growing our community because that's what we think is important. And that was very different, and it built a lot of trust, quite frankly, uh, for other organizations to really come in and do that. So you don't see that so much. <laughs> I haven't seen that for a while, and I remember that experience being very clear in my head. These people know what they're doing. They are actively losing control of this project because they, only, they know the only way it's going to succeed is if they effectively do that, right? And that was the experience in that particular very large uh, project, um, and I think it was a substantial factor in its success. In fact, the, the last OpenStack release came out uh, two weeks ago, and on time, it was the 29th, I think, or something along those lines. Uh, what is that, 14 years later? So uh, that really made a difference. And that actively losing control is way harder than it seems, and I think it already seems hard. Uh, like, I've been involved in communities where I saw individuals as well as companies struggle with that, like uh, notions of, yes, I will invest in community building if you can guarantee me that it will diversify my project and ecosystem. Now, is there a guarantee for that? No. But there's a guarantee that if you're not investing in your community, then the return will also be very similar to that. Yeah, and I find personally that what has been happening with single vendor projects is eroding the trust of organizations that are actively trying to start something for the benefit of everybody, right? I mean, there's a lot of good reasons to start projects and build a collaboration, be it, um, because it's, it's, it's a good thing for a platform where interoperability is gonna be very important and so we should be doing that together. Or it's an organization who recognizes, you know, I need to do some piece of something, but it's actually applicable to an entire range of use cases and those other use cases would bring value to what I'm trying to do as two common examples of why you start an open source project. So single vendor projects, single projects being initiated by a single organization aren't a bad thing. Um, it's the intent that's really important, but that intent now is obfuscated. I personally am not sure if I can trust the next open, single vendor open source project because they say one thing in the beginning and then they do something different in the end, right? That's, that's, that's a loss of trust. So I think this particular topic is, and, and particularly the license changes, um, is an issue. It's a significant issue for the trust across the ecosystem. So. I know that there are some that disagree with what the Linux Foundation is doing, for example, with OpenTofu and now with Valky. I stand in support of it because I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the changing direction with how you can use a collaborative effort from one day to the next when you said you were trying to build a community. So the, the previous uh, single vendor slide was pointing more towards 
ignorance sometimes in terms of understanding open source, how it works, what makes the concept and ecosystem work beyond the license type as a community and collaborative environment. And as Phil was saying, the lack of trust these days even more uh, is coming from what we often call bait and switch model. Who heard about that before? Anybody aware? Yeah. So uh, that model is basically when the initial intent uh, when the project is created is that the license will be switched later. The idea is to use open source as kind of a, I don't know, marketing and sales uh, avenue to build up a reputation uh, for the software usually. And then when it seems successful enough, enough uh, just flip the switch uh, to a uh, business source, whatever other kind of closed source license and say that this is our proprietary product now, or sort of. Uh, but the lines are a little blurry there, and it just sometimes it still looks open source-ish, but it is not. And listed a few examples on the slide, and as Phil mentioned before, um, if, the, if the project got popularity, that will not stop anybody from forking and, and keeping it open. So the license switch at the end of the day is not going to work. However, this is very disruptive and harmful to the open source ecosystem. I mean, sometimes I feel personally offended as a person who's been contributing to open source for 11 years and others to take advantage of it this way and kind of sending the message out to everybody that you cannot trust open source because this is what's gonna happen. I think that's, yeah. Um, I don't have words that can go into recording, <laughs> but, um, and I assume there's an agreement to some extent within this room. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, open source is a license type. At the same time, a lot of people don't really have a good understanding of the licenses, uh, don't really know which are the OSI compliant licenses, um, a lot of arguments uh, about things like copyleft, GPL license, uh, and a lot of misunderstandings in this space, which can also be really, really harmful. And we are not talking about the license switch here, just the simple fact of, I'm open sourcing my project, but what license am I, am I supposed to pick? I should not pick GPL, it's not permissive. A lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings are out there about licenses. And like, maybe I will pick this one because Bob did too for his project. And that's not the way to go about licenses. So that is something that requires a lot more education in both um, on the side of communities as well as for corporations. Yeah, I, I find this to be a <clears throat> often misunderstood topic in organizations. Um, just taking the recent license changes as an example. Um, so uh, again, Terraform under, um, under uh, MPL2 uh, had some level of uh, restrictions with regard to how it has to stay um, and what can, be, what can be incorporated into a proprietary work without um, some kind of attestation and so forth. Um, so in that case, there were some small contributions that had been taken in the Terraform uh, public that they weren't able to take and put under a different license. They didn't have the right to change the license of that code. BSD3 is what Redis was under, and you can put BSD3 in anything. and You can turn it proprietary from one day to the next, and that's something that um, Redis Labs is able to do. Most organizations are fearful of the GPL license, but I, I found, and I, I was trained by a very, very wise lawyer by the name of Scott Peterson back in my HP days. And Scott had convinced the HP leadership that if HP was going to contribute something, we actually wanted it under GPL because it meant that we were putting out our intellectual property for others to use, but nobody could take our intellectual property and put it into their proprietary product without exposing that proprietary product. So if you're a contributor, GPL is actually a really good license. And if you wanna go drive a community, 
that's a really good license to use, including for large organizations. But that's, it's not really well understood at all in the legal ranks, in my experience, in the legal ranks of, of large organizations. Uh, I considered HP to be pretty uh, leading in that mindset. And again, I attribute it to Scott Peterson. But license matters is the moral of the story. And we also established that open source is a license type, but it's not just a license type. So when you look at uh, licenses like Apache 2, take the software, do whatever you want with it. You don't have to contribute back. You can make modifications. The world is free. It's all yours. And very often, at least in my experience, it is still interpreted as free of charge. I took it. It's mine. Golden. And that is a misconception in terms of if you take one version of open source, never contribute back, build a product on it, you could not do anything worse to yourself than that. A lot of maintenance burden comes with that, and at one point you will not be able to, uh, to keep it up. So it's actually a better and the only sustainable investment is to contribute back and become part of that community and ecosystem around the project that you decided to use. But again, it can get counterintuitive because it was just there. I just took it. Like, why do I have to do anything in that open, collaborative, open source community environment after that? Yeah, I was, I was fortunate enough to be in the previous talk in this track. Uh, before lunch, and the, the whole notion of a maturity level of open source with organizations was kind of rattling through my head as I was listening to the, the questions and, the, and the, the answers from the group. And, you know, in the beginning, and certainly uh, a lot of companies were this way in the early 2000s, where just figuring out how to get open source in and how to do it in a reliable and a, and a, and a, and a, in a risk-mitigated manner was the new thing. Right, and then a lot of the conversation that was happening in the last talk was, okay, so how do we get folks to contribute, right? It's always easier to do the fo local fork to get the product out the door, to get the thing done, as opposed to having to work with the community. Gee, they want me to write more tests. Gee, they want me to refactor this thing so that it's good for everybody. There's all this extra stuff I gotta do. I can I'm just fork, right? So the question then is, you know, how do you get an organization to contribute back? Well. If we're successful with that, then all of those contributions back means that somebody has to be doing the reviews to make sure that the code coming in is stable and, and, and the group can be, the, 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 um, the project can be sustainable in that manner. Well, then how do you convince your organization to actually go to the level of reviewing other people's code? You're, you're stepping farther and farther away from that product out the door that the, that the product manager really wants. But it's this whole, it's this whole ecosystem and each piece you know, each success, right, using open source, contributing to open source, then getting to reviews of open source, they, they're all, they all lead to the next problem, right? And so we have to think of that more as the totality of this 80% of code base to everything we're doing, right? Because in the end, having that as sustainable is important. Um, so these were just some of the things that, again, were just going through my head just in the last talk. And I think, I think many people here touch upon those in their experience um, and again, certainly I do as well. So I want to get to the point where we actually ask you for some of your experiences, but let's go on. We have a lot more things on the slide so we can speed it up a little bit. Um, this is something to, uh, to raise awareness in case uh, people are not following this closely. Uh, open source grew and became successful enough to be recognized by governments all around the globe. Uh, listed a few examples, Cyber Resiliency Act and uh, Product Liability Directive in Europe, uh, Securing Open Source Software Act in the uh, US are just examples uh, to regulations, legislations, new policies being discussed and defined by governments. However, um, it, especially if you were following the, uh, the development of CRA um, up until today, you could see that there, there have been a lot of misunderstandings uh, about open source, even in that space. 
So it is the responsibility of all of us in this ecosystem to make sure that education and communication happens so there is no misunderstanding about what open source is and how it works in governments when they are creating new uh, laws and regulations. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add, I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to add anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've started to come to the recognition that, um, you know, never let a good catastrophe go to waste. And I think we have one in front of us. XZ, Log4j, the CRA with the requirements for support and, and, and understanding of vulnerabilities in the software, this is all shining a very bright light on that 80% of code. Um, if, there's a, if there's a fork in the road for organizations to say, oh my gosh, this stuff is so scary, let me go away. And then all of the product engineering managers say, oh, not use open source? I don't think that's actually an option. So then how do we actually mitigate the risks associated with the CRA and things like XC? It, it, it means that we have to get more involved. I think this is an opportunity, and I don't think that we should let this catastrophe go to waste. And to build on the security comments, um, open source is very often viewed uh, through kind of generalized glasses in a way that if you hit up Google search and uh, search for open source and security, you will be told that open source as is, is the most secure or the least secure, first two hits. Um, if you're not very familiar with, again, open source, the open source ecosystem, which one will you believe? How you even start to understand the space? And the problem with this is that it paints a black and white picture, even though open source is an ecosystem. Again, we all have roles and responsibilities here, so we can all work on our own projects and projects we are contributing to, to make them more secure. But you can't say that open source in itself as a term, as a collaborative uh, software development is the least secure option to build any kind of so software solutions? Yeah. The answer is yes to both, right? In some cases, it is the most secure because there are that many eyes on it. In other places, it isn't that secure because there aren't. Just because open source has the ability to have a lot of eyes on it doesn't mean that it does. That again is back to those that of us that are users, we have to make sure we have eyes on. And again, it's a, it's a collective responsibility to secure open source software the same way or better than how proprietary ones are. And I, um, I hinted that we will get a little bit closer into that and what else you can be in this ecosystem topic because uh, another misconception that I very often meet with is contributors being directly um, uh, translated to developer. Is there anyone here today who's contributing but does not write code? There you go. It's like, what, <laughs> one third of the room at least? So uh, we have to stop uh, meaning developer when we say contributor. Um, there are developers who are contributing and there are people who do all kinds of other things when they are contributing. So um, this really points towards the uh, diversity uh, within communities and at the same time, the diversity within organizations because you know it's, it's kind of a no-brainer when, when an organization, a company decides that they are going to, after all, give something back. There, there are those three software developers, 20% of their time or how big amount or small amount of their time will go into writing some code, go fix some bugs. So at least we you know, build some reputations for ourselves. But having an OSPO, having a developer advocate, having any other roles, technical writer, um, someone who thinks about how to talk about the project, dirty word, marketing. It is really important. Open source projects have to be advertised and advocated for the same way as you do for your commercial products. And those are crucial roles and those are usually the first that get cut when there isn't enough budget. Like how many OSPOs were cut or shrunk to a little tiny bit of one person thing when, uh, when the economy wasn't the best, even though it should have been the last piece to cut. And 
Maybe we can stop here and ask people for their experiences. <laughs> okay. We are, I think we're out of time. I don't know how. Or I think it's 55. Yeah. 55. Oh, 55. Oh, no, we have time. Then we just simply ask for your experience. Yes. Um, Anybody want to talk about their experience or challenges or successes or that you've had in this space? Or anything that you related to in what we talked about. Yes, and I have no mic. I will, I will get one. Do we have a handheld mic? Apologies. <laughs> Either? There we go. It's open source. We fix it on the fly. <laughs> Rolling back to what you had said about using GPL for external contributions by mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. um, making it so that it would make it so that everybody else had to follow the same terms. Does that make it more difficult to distribute applications later using that same uh, thing that you've just improved because now all the code that touches a strong copy left is now has to be released as well Not as long as everybody that's participating is willing to those same terms Right. I mean the as long as what you're contributing and what you're adding so company a puts something out in, in, in GPL <coughs> Company B and C and D can all use that GPL code as long as what they're adding is also put out into open source so company A puts out a release under GPL. Company mm -hmm. A then wants to create an application using that library or package or mm -hmm. project. All the other code that directly touches it is now also considered to be GPL. Now, but see, but, and, and so and, and if that's the way you want to work it, and this is how, this is actually one of the business models, right, of smaller mm -hmm. organizations. MySQL did this forever, right? If you're the sole copyright owner of something, you can actually put it under multiple licenses. So you can put it out under GPL, and you can put it out under proprietary. Well, and if I'm, that's the mode I'm not arguing. Go. I'm just trying to say, if we wanted to use this GPL as a model for releases, mm -hmm. then it has implications for future use by that same company. Only if others contribute other things to that GPL version, right? So if you put a, a, a project out there in GPL, and you get a great community, and they're adding stuff to it, you can't take the things that others have added and put it into your proprietary product and keep it proprietary. You can, anything you wrote, you can license as many different ways as you want in different products. So for standalone projects, it would make sense, but not necessarily for something you were going to be using as part of larger applications if you wanted to keep the, if you wanted to not- Exactly, if you want to build a community and leverage the others in the community, then yes, you have to, you have to take care of that. The other thing that lawyers often got incorrectly or don't think about is the patent implications as well because you give your patents to whatever it is you're putting out under that GPL, but it's only to that GPL code. That doesn't mean that you can't enforce that patent on some other code base. And if, again, another organization is using the GPL version, then they're obligated to pass along everything else. So even your patents are protected in that sense because it is isolated to just that GPL code. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Ah. See how by me just standing here as the lazy guy, I ended up getting Eldigo to do all the running. She also does all the editing for the podcast, so the vast majority of the really good technical stuff is Eldigo. So yes, she does deserve a round of applause. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just kind of curious about the part that was brought up at the end about like expanding the definition of a contributor. And the reason I'm curious about that is because I'm actually a designer and I'm really new to open source. This is my first time at Open Source Summit, which is really cool, I really like it. But I'm trying to understand like where does design fit in there? Because a lot of open source from what I've seen is highly focused on developers, <laughs> but I really want to contribute to the community as well. And I want design to be um, part of it and just like more open and accessible to people and stuff like that. So I'm trying to figure that out. We don't have to talk about it necessarily right now, but for <laughs> anyone who does want to talk about it, I would love to talk anytime. And are you talking user experience type design? Or I'm user types? experience, yeah, okay. but really anything I'm open to. So yes, so you know, the, the old phrase goes that you know, open source is built by developers for developers. 
and that is painstakingly true when they point you to the code for documentation, um, <laughs> which is a notorious thing. Um, similarly, yes, we are not the best at design and user experience either. Um, and there are entire organizations that have built an, a, a business around making cool open source technology actually accessible to the normal human mm -hmm. um, that doesn't know how to write code. Um, so yeah. yes, we are, in, we are in sore supply of designers. Um, <laughs> and you should find lots of opportunities. And yeah, just, just keep reminding people that it's, it's not just about the code. Like code is not everything, even though it is a base for a lot of things. And okay. I try not to take the microphone close, close to the speaker. Yes. And uh, now I think we are successfully behind. So let's rush ahead. We've, we've, we've worked hard to get here to be behind on our slide deck. Yeah. I mean, I do believe we have arrived. Um, open source is hard to justify. Again, previous talk earlier in the morning uh, touched upon this. Um, and it really does have to do with that. And investment is, is a key word, right? I've seen so many developers say, well, but you know, we have to give back. We're getting all of this value. We have to give back. And that falls on deaf ears when it comes to corporate management. They don't care. If it came for free, that's awesome. You know, and I think uh, free as in puppy is, is what we came up with next. And that's not bad. It's better, right? If you, you know, okay, it was free and you got it now and then it's gonna take a dump all over your shoes if you don't do something. Right, there's training, there's, there's effort, there's work involved. Um, but that still isn't exactly the corporate environment, right? Um, think of it in terms of this software is your software supply chain and they don't want your money. They want in-kind payment. They want investment in the form of in-kind payment. And that means you engage with it, you actually put resources in, you gain the benefit of having influence in actually steering this platform or this component upon which you heavily rely. These are the terms that do have and do foster um, better acceptance of wanting to actually engage in open source because, again, it is your software supply chain and we're learning it's fragile, right? XZ shows it's fragile. Log4j, you know, that, was a, that was an innocent mistake with not quite enough eyes on it, and, but it shows the ubiquity <laughs> of the software um, in what can go wrong. One thing to add, because I promised Alex that I will point fingers at him, so I oh, will. I can, I can too. <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, about the, the justifying and uh, like talking about the value of open source, if you're wondering how to sell it to management that indeed the company has to contribute back. Watch the episode we have with Alex Scammon uh, on the podcast where we talk about that you in fact can quantify the risks of not contributing back. You can quantify how much it will cost you when you are not contributing back because you can put numbers to it and you have to and that will be something that will speak the management language because if they hear that oh my god it's going to cost me this much down the road to maintaining my fork maybe i will think it twice yeah and we'll apparently end um on this notion of um when we talk about open source you want to talk about open source strategy Okay, I think one of the problems we have today is many open source program offices sit relatively low in the organization. And again, when 80% of your supply chain is this open source stuff, there's an argument to be made that it should be higher. Um, I think the role of a chief open source officer is one that makes more sense than the director of an open source program office. Because it's not just about the risk mitigation of the inbound, it's how do you strategically work in open source communities so that they align to what your business needs are over time. When it comes to the question about, well, gee, I can do the local fork so much faster and my product team needs to get this thing out the door. Well, part of the reason it's slower is because you've not built any trust in that community. Nobody knows you. So if you're gonna dump a bunch of code into a community, are you gonna be around to support it? So I, I started working on this several years ago. Uh, it initially came out of some discussions with Linux developers, but I find it true to be the case in many different open source um, activities for organizations where 80% of your developers are focused on that 20% of the code that's actually yours, 
right? And they're working on product differentiation with the features and the tools and the things that you need. On the other side of that spectrum, that green bubble is 5% of your workforce that does 80% of their activity in upstream. They are the reviewers. They are gaining influence. They are the maintainers. They're also working with the adjacent projects to that community so that they're building out their professional network to be able to get things done, get questions answered, get bugs resolved, get features in, be able to communicate in an open source community the way that community needs to hear it so that it's acceptable. Um, and the other 20% of their time, they're actually mentoring those two other groups. And then there's 15% who are pivoting back and forth. If there's stuff to be done on the product and differentiation side, they're working with the blue bubble folks. If there's something that needs to get pushed upstream, they're getting mentored by the folks in the green bubble to get those changes pushed up into the upstream and in the most efficient way possible so that it is um, as, as fast as possible with as little friction as possible. So as a model to think about in your development staff, that kind of distribution of labor, I think makes a lot of sense for efficiency and it minimizes that local forks that we all know just cost a lot of money over time, right? So you try to avoid that. Um, we are out of time. Any last words, Ildigo? Uh, two, three sentences. Uh, just one comment to strategy. Like I, uh, I saw it a couple of times, more than a couple, that like the uh, director of open source or open source leader position is actually in the marketing and marketing team and department's budget. Now, that's a strategy set up to fail because you could not put the person further away from product development, <laughs> which is, if you saw the previous slide, it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So stop doing that. And um, yep. last but not least, we want to hear from you uh, in person, just as a casual hallway chat. You can go on camera with us. I have camera and microphones for video shorts. <laughs> we want to hear experience on the podcast. Uh, so find us and talk to us, please. We would like to learn from you because believe it or not, this is all about you. Yep. So yeah, um, shameless plug, watch, listen to the podcast. <laughs> uh, if you think you have some interesting stories to tell, uh, like I said, uh, please come find us. We can do something short here, or we can schedule you for a, a longer session as one of the podcast guests. And All if right? you watch the podcast, give us feedback. Thank that you. That too. That too. <laughs> Thank you.